Lord. That's good. I'm glad that we get saved, come to Calvary, and, and, and we can go back to Calvary when we need to, uh, which is constantly. All right. Everybody ready? Zero degrees up the mountains. 11 here. Glad we got heat on in here this morning. Thank you, men, for working and uh, making sure everything that. Sometimes people wonder why you take up an offering in church. That's one of the reasons right there. Be mighty cold in here without that. And so uh, uh, when we all do our part, it keeps everything going. Now, take your Bibles this morning, and I want to turn to two places in Scripture. Exodus chapter 20, uh, 33 first. And when you get Exodus 33, uh, hold your finger there and get First John, not St. John, First John chapter number 4. So I'm going to look at two passages of Scripture this morning uh, to begin this message. And I'm going to uh, preach a message that uh, will help you a little bit doctrinally and, and uh, spiritually also. A subject that's confused a lot of people. And I've had people ask me about this many, many times. To be honest with you, when I first got saved and started reading the Bible, I run across stuff like this, and it made me wonder. And uh, so I'm going to preach this morning on this subject. How to see God. How to see God. I mean, people, uh, people say, well, I don't, I don't, the person of God, I want to see him. I want to show you this morning what the Bible says about how to see God. Look here. Exodus chapter number 33. And uh, we'll look this morning at verse number 20. Exodus 33 and verse 20. I think God's speaking to Moses. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me. God said, and the Lord said, I'm just going to pass by and let you see my back, but you cannot see my face. God wouldn't let him see it. Now, 1 John, way over yonder toward the end of the Bible, 1 John chapter number, number, four, uh, number 4, and look at verse number 12. Verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, uh, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected. Now you say, now wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute. Immediately, if you read the Bible, other scriptures start popping in your head. Didn't it say uh, uh, in in Exodus 33, 20, there that God told Moses, you can't see my face. And then in another place, didn't it say, God said, I speak to my servant Moses face to face. Sure did. Uh, didn't it say in, J in Genesis 32, 30, that Jacob saw God, Jacob saw the Lord. But when he saw the angel of the Lord, now stuff like that's what gets people confused. One place said you can't see him. Another place said you do see him. And there's where you have to study and rightly divide the word of truth. Now, let me give you some more scripture here to think about. Um, in uh, John chapter 14, verse 8, they asked the Lord, Jesus, they said, uh, look, Jesus, if, if show us the Father. You, show us God. Show us. We want to see him. And the Lord looked at him and said, look, guy, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What about that? So Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen God. That's what he said. And then he said, no man's seen God at any time. But then he said in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then we'll deal in Revelation here in just a little bit. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And then it said, in the end of the book of Revelation, it said that we'll see him face to face. So to break that down simply this morning, the best we can figure it out, it would be nobody in this physical body could see God, the Father, in his glory your, your, this body couldn't take it. it. It'd kill you. The brightness, the glory, the power in our sinful condition, you couldn't see it. So something has to be fixed 
before we can literally see God. And that's, what, that's why we get saved. And that's why. But at the same time, we can see him now. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you this morning how I see God. Number one, I see God in creation. I see God in grace. Now, I'm not talking about a nature worshiper, a nature lover, where you, where you say, I don't go to church, I don't read the Bible, I see God. In I ain't talking about that. I'm not about the God of the Bible, with the Bible, I can see God in creation. There's scripture for that. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 said, the invisible things of him are clearly seen. That means we can't see it with them eyes. We can't see God in heaven with these eyes right now. But the things of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Right? I can't see a carpenter saw this wood. I see the results. I see what he did. So I can say, I see the carpenter's work in this table right here. I see the electrician's work, these lights shining out in here. I see the, uh, the uh, plumber's work with, uh, with the water coming out this thing. We see that. And I see God this morning in his creation. Now look, people, I know we're living in a time when a lot of people claim to be atheists, but honest, you know what? You know what I think? I think among really educated people, the, the number of atheists is beginning to shrink. There's a lot of them starting to figure out. Now, I didn't say got saved, but there's a lot of them after we figured out DNA and learned all about what we're learning about the universe, the human body. A lot of real honest scientists are saying, look, this couldn't have come from nowhere. There had to be a cause for what we see. Now, that's a step in the right direction. They won't acknowledge the God of the Bible, of course, uh, because then they'd have to get right. But they say there's got to be some kind of intelligent designer or an architect somewhere in the universe because we can clearly see it. Look, people, the world, the sun, the moon, the earth, the atmosphere, time, space, matter, love, emotions, childbirth, all of that screams creator. Creator. This couldn't have happened by itself. There had to be a creator. Amen? That's right, brother. Uh, DNA, the complexity of cells in the human body, uh, they're, they're just saying, whoa, can't be. Now, when somebody believes in evolution, uh, it's not really fair to take kids in school and say, kids, we know that evolution is a fact. That's not fair, it's not honest, and it's not right. Uh, they, there are actually six types of evolution. And every college, university, world, well, they, if they, teach, they'll, they'll, they say they believe, they teach six different types of evolution. First of all, of course, there'd be cosmic. That's space, matter, uh, uh, outer space, stuff like that. Second would be chemical evolution. That's the higher elements like hydrogen and stuff like that. Third, there's stellar, stellar, uh, or planetary, stars, uh, moon, sun. And the planets out in, in space. Fourth, there's organic life. All this come from nothing, you know. And all this come from something that wasn't alive. Something alive come from something that wasn't alive. Uh, that's not science. That's religion. You believe that by faith. Then there's macro evolution, which is animals, um, uh, birds, uh, humans. Dogs, cats, all kinds of animals uh, coming from nowhere, nothing. And then finally, there's macro, micro evolution. Now, if there's any truth to evolution, it's micro. Micro evolution means variation in the species. Like uh, an animal, a bird or something, beak will grow longer in a certain part of the world or grow more feathers in a heavy, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, cold environment or, or uh, they have more wool or, or a covering on their body uh, because adapt, adapted to where they live. A bird growing a beak longer over thousands of years is what they call microevolution. That's way different from a bird turning into a, a, a dog and then to a, something else into a human. That don't happen. 
See, the Bible said, God said, everything brings forth after its kind. After its kind. And there's never been nothing that reproduced something that wasn't after its own kind. That's, that's where, that's where uh, uh, creation comes in. Because that's impossible. It can't be. Like you take the elephant. Uh, the, the elephant, for example. You ever studied uh, much about elephants? They're so unique. They are uh, the largest, if not the largest, mammal uh, in that an elephant is, um, is, is a strange thing. Some of them, mammals have hair. Some of them have a little bit of hair. Some of them are really hairy, like them big old mastodons and stuff like that. They have that long trunk. And an elephant's trunk is real sensitive on the end. You know, their little little snout there at the end of it. And that thing, they can move around. Like, like if that chair was in their way, they could take that thing and move it out of the way over here. They can also do it like that and make a sound like a trumpet. They can also take that trunk and, and make it like a little vacuum cleaner and, and stuff. They can also take that trunk and, and move that pulpit out of the way. They push a car over with that thing. And scientists say... They, they say there's they they've always been elephants. That, where'd they come from? There's no little elephant, little and where they you know where, where they evolved up. It's a strange thing, and they're really smart. And things are elephant never forgets. You know, uh, they uh, it's unbelievable. Dogs. We talked about dogs the other night at church uh, as on our study and by dogs come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, but they're still dogs. Dogs don't turn into elephants. Dogs produce dogs. Elephants produce Elephant. God said, the Bible said everything brings forth after its kind. Uh, some of them have a long, no, no. You know, dogs, dogs have more smell. They like maybe a thousand times better smell than we do. Now, you say, boy, wouldn't I, I don't know if I'd want to smell a thousand times better than I already do. I'm sort of glad I can't. I, I mean, I can smell, uh, I ain't going to say, uh, but good enough as it is. Uh, but they can smell. You ever notice a dog goes up, so they can smell a, a dead animal or something that way over on the other side of the parking lot. You ever notice when you when you come in to a house, I was visiting the house yesterday, walked in the house, this dog came over to me, and I always look at him, I went, I went, I'd say, if they wag their tail, you know, I'm all right. And he, he didn't wag his tail. And I went, he went, hey! And I said, boy, I'm going to tase you. I, I didn't have no taser with me. But uh, anyway, he kept, and, I, and I was trying to be friendly to him. And he, he goes, he's putting his nose on like this all over my leg. All over. And I was trying to talk to this man. I could feel like I wanted to just go. But I didn't. Uh, uh, he, he, he was doing like that. And them things can smell. They can, they can smell on my, my shoes if I'd been around another dog. Or something like that. It's amazing. It's amazing. And you know that they say. Scientists say that history is contentious about how dogs got here. In other words, they have no idea. Uh, they have no idea. I know where they how they got here. They, 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 they didn't just develop by chance. Beavers, little animals like beavers, um, they keep using their, their teeth. The, the more a beaver uses his teeth, the sharper they get, like cutting down trees and stuff. That's a cool little thing, man. Uh, them little lay on them little razor sharp teeth, and they have no idea. They have two types of fur: one fur that goes up against their body, a little, and then another fur like a fur coat on on the outside. And uh, and you know what they find about hair? They find fossils that they say are millions of years old, and they have hair. And so, where'd that hair come from? Did you know that people used to be hairy like animals, and we evolved out of ours? Oh boy, it got, we, we had to evolve out of our hair. That's a hard one to explain if you're an evolutionist. I mean, how did we get worse? Uh, uh, we're, we're, we have to wear clothes, put coats on. And, but anyway, uh, it's, I, I can see God. I can see God, even though it's fallen, even though it's flawed, even though there's, uh, uh, there's the, 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 the planet shows signs everywhere of just being absolutely tore all to pieces several more than one time i can see god in creation we see it there in uh, the second law of thermodynamics which an established law uh, teaches that eventually everything where runs down the way you know evolution is not true there's a law just like the law of gravity let me show you the law of gravity there it is that's a law that's a law and if I do that 10,000 times, that's what's going to happen. That's the law. Something pulling everything down. 
uh, to the center of this earth. They're pushing it one. And you're, you're pulled down uh, by gravity. There's another law. Second law of thermodynamics. That means everything wears out. That means you have to paint your car. That means you have to fix the roof. That means you have to repair the stuff gets old and it rots. It don't get better. It don't get better. And so they say, here's what they believe. They believe we come from the goo, the, the goo to the zoo to me and you. That's basically what science believes. From the goo to the zoo to me and you. And, of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, that, that cannot happen. A design proves a designer. A design proves a designer. This sharp corners on this thing right here, any court of law in the world, you can prove somebody. This, they didn't just find this laying out in the woods. Somebody designed this. That's how I see God. I see God in His creation. But let me say secondly this morning. I see God. You know how I see God? I see God in the lives of transformed men. I see men that get saved and come to this, believe this truth, what I'm preaching this morning, and the transformation in their life is so big, so drastic, so permanent, so that, that I, you can see God. People say, boy, ever since old so-and-so got saved, I can just see the Lord in him. You ever say that? I can see God in the lives of transformed men. I believe in Christianity uh, just like I believe in the sunrise. Not just that I see it. Listen to this. I believe in Christianity like I believe in the sunrise. Not just that I see it, but because of it I can see everything else. I see the sunrise, and because of the sunrise, I can see everything else. I believe in Christianity because I see it, and it show, I can see everything else because of it. Ladies and gentlemen, there's an old man one time, old boy named Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was a baseball player and played professional baseball. You've heard me tell about him before. He's held the record, uh, I think it's the National League, whatever he played for, running the bases, running barefooted in his bare feet. And he had the fastest time of running the bases in that. Billy Sunday was a great baseball player. And him and a bunch of his buddies were out in Chicago, uh, drunk one night, and they'd, they'd been in a saloon, and they'd all been in there drinking, and they came out. And when he came out, he heard something. And there's a group of people out of there standing in front of this little building, and they, instruments, and they were singing hymns, and they were singing about the Lord and everything, and it touched his heart. So that old boy stood there, and for a minute, he remembered a log cabin back in Iowa where he was raised. And his mother was there teaching him about that. He said, whatever they're doing, that's the same thing my mom taught me. Started dealing with it, and tears started coming out of his eyes. I mean, a baseball player. Held the world record running the bases. And he started crying like this right here. And, you know, you know, a lot of these NFL players and stuff get saved now. And they cut their testimony in half when they give the Lord the glory because they don't want you to see that part of it. Uh, buddy, I'll tell you what. You know what? Uh, 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 old Billy Sunday looked at them. He, he started crying. And he said, boys, I'm gone. They said, what you talking about? He said, I'm done. He said, I'm going to Jesus. And they said, you lost your mind? And Billy Sunday went over there, and he got down, and he got born again. And Billy Sunday got born again, and the next day said some of his friends mocked. Some of them laughed at him, and some of them said, look, I'm proud of you, man. I, I don't. So he went and told his manager the next day. Uh, he said, uh, he said, Billy, I saw it in the newspaper. It's in the newspaper now. You're a Christian. You know about that? He said, that's right, sir. And his manager told him this. Back in them days when people talk like that, uh, his manager told him this. He said, look. I ain't a religious man. I don't go to church or nothing like that, but I respect it. And uh, he said, uh, if anybody knocks you for what you've done, you tell me and I'll knock the devil out of the hill. That's what his manager told him. And Billy Sunday left baseball and left a salary of what we'd say like millions of dollars a year down to, uh, uh, you know, preaching. Uh, evangelist message and he preached all over the country and Billy Sunday preached in ta tents and tabernacles and people got saved by the tens of thousands of thousands and Billy, Billy Sunday was the premier evangelist in America up until the time Billy Graham started. Billy Sunday passed on, Billy Graham took over from then. Ladies and gentlemen, I see God 
in the lives of men. No way you explain that. Give up millions of dollars. Turn their back on the old life and stay right and preach the Bible that they once laughed at. I see God when people's lives change like that. I heard about these guys up in Kentucky and they had a street ministry and it was out there and they and they would and made up little cards like uh, like this and they made up these little cards and the card said get right with God and they kept them on their on their bags and on their and they put them on their shirts and and stuff like that and they had these little cards that says get right with God and so one of them had a bulldog uh, and they brought that little bulldog over and he had a big old had a big old uh, one of them Tags on his, around his neck, and they stuck one of them cards on that bulldog's uh, tag. They run off, went on home, and they was having a revival, and they was trying to get everybody to come. And there's this one man in town that begged him to come, and he wouldn't come. And they'd witness to him and witness to him, and he wouldn't listen. And they tried their best to get him to come. Well, lo and behold, that night at the revival, that old boy showed up, and somebody preached. And he got up out of his seat, came down front, and got saved. And they said, oh, my goodness, our prayers are answered. Our prayers are answered. That man got saved. And they got to talk to him after church. They said, what changed your mind? He said, I didn't want to hear these preachers. I didn't want to talk to him." He said, I was sitting in my porch the other day, and he said, there's a dog barking and wouldn't quit barking and wouldn't quit barking. And I went out there, and his old neighbor's bulldog, and I went over there and told him to hush. He said, that dog had a sign that said, get right with God. And he said, I seen that sign on there. And he thought, you know what? God, if you love me enough to send a dog over here to tell me, I'm, I'm, I'm giving up. I'm, I'm giving up. That's all I can take. That boy got saved. Look, people, I see God when he does something like that in the middle of life. Amen? Don't let this world, the news media, and some weird little, little weirdos on TV who think they're smart and mock the Bible, don't let them intimidate you one bit. We've got the God of the Bible. We know He's real. I see God in the lives of changed men. I told you about Father Chiniki, who was a Roman Catholic priest in Chicago, up near Chicago. Large church back years ago. Thousand people be there on Sunday morning. One Sunday morning, Father Chiniki, there's a book that thick about it called 50 Years in the Church of Rome. He'd been, a, he'd been a Roman Catholic priest for 30 years. And he stood in front of that congregation that morning and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I resign the priesthood. And everybody went, Uh oh, what's wrong? Something happened? Is he gone crazy? Is he turned atheist? One. He said, I got to hold the truth. Of the Bible. He said I stayed up all night last night. Thanking God. For what he had done for me. He said I realized that salvation. He come to that scripture that said. Salvation is, is by. The, the Just shall live by faith. And by grace through faith. Not of yourselves. Like he's talking about in Sunday school. It's a gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. And you know what he said. He said folks. I'm not a priest anymore. I resign. I'm depending only and solely and completely on the grace of God to save me. He said, I'm a Christian now. I don't believe it's in Mary. I don't believe it's in the penance. I don't believe in purgatory. I don't believe in the sacraments anymore. I, he said, Here's what he said. He said, I've accepted the gift and I love the giver. And he talked for 45 minutes and it had 900 something people got saved that morning. And it turned into a Presbyterian church and they preached to God. I see God. I see God. You hear about men like Colonel Sanders. Same thing. You hear about people like oh, like Tim Tebow. So I know a lot of people judge people like that and everything. But listen, man. I, uh, that old Kirk Cameron and all them people. They they wasn't taught right on the Bible. But God got a hold of their life. God done something for them people. Amen. That's when you turn around and walk out of Hollywood and turn down fame and fortune and say, no, I'm going to go talk in church and talk about me. Something happens to you that makes you do that. Finally, I'll say this and I'm through. Well, I ain't neither. Uh, don't get your hopes up. Quickly, I see God in the Bible. I see God in the Bible. The more I read the Bible, the more I see God. I mean, you can see Him, brother, on every page. He's the greatest wonder of the, of the world. The Bible is the greatest wonder of the world, brother. I mean, a book of books, 66 books, 40 different authors, 
1,500 years. Most of the men never even knew each other. And yet it all comes together in one book, 66 books, one book, telling us our past, our present. It talks about the fall of man, the plan of God, the birth of Jesus, the virgin birth, the taking of our place on the cross for sinners, the world's greatest love story. It's the greatest history book. There's never been a historical error proved in the Bible. There's never been a scientific error proved in the Bible. There's never been a mathematical problem proved wrong in the Bible. Nobody's ever found a mistake. You say, well, I know somebody said the Bible had mistakes. At something show you one. Show them one. The mistake ain't in here. It's in their brain, buddy. Listen, if there had been a mistake in this book, somebody would have found it by now. It's historically correct. Did you know all them things they talk about? They talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. They find that stuff. They've even found Noah's Ark. That don't make me believe in it. But it just confirms what we already believe. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah, brother. Listen, it's the book of all books. It's the book of all books. You know, the book of uh, people say, well, what about the lost books in the Bible? What about the book of Enoch? What about the book of them? What about the ones that ain't in there? Now, let me, let me just help you down. I've got to hurry. Uh, there ain't no lost books of the Bible. That is a hillbilly rendition of Bible teaching this morning. God didn't lose no books. He preserved his word. Every one of these that's in here is supposed to be in here. And there ain't none of them that's supposed to be in here uh, that ain't in here. There ain't no such thing as that. That's right. The book of Enoch don't claim to be inspired. The apostles never quoted from the book of Enoch. It might have some truth in it. And I'm sure it does. But it, there's 66 inspired books in the canon that's like a cat and a gun by straight. And they are the Word of God. You say, how do you know that? Because of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. Watch it now. They come by pretty fast. Hold your bat up. The book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. There's a complete division. Now remember, Isaiah didn't even know there was going to be chapters. He just wrote it on a scroll. Isaiah didn't know there's going to be a Bible. He just wrote what God gave him. 700 B.C. Wound up 66 books in the Bible, 66 chapters in Isaiah. After chapter 39, there's a break. There's a definite break between chapter 39 and the last 27. Isn't that something? You know what that's a picture of? There's 39 books in the Old Testament. There's 27 in the New Testament. Did you know what chapter 40 in Isaiah said? He said, Behold, one crieth in the desert, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist. You know when John the Baptist come? In the 40th book, Matthew. Begin in the New Testament. 39, Old Testament. 40, New Testament. Matthew to Revelation. John the Baptist comes up preaching. Behold, that's the fulfillment of that prophecy. Chapter 40. Oh, that's a coincidence. Well, you reckon it's a coincidence that chapter 66 of Isaiah matches Revelation, the 66 book, where it said, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. Yeah. Reckon that's a coincidence? Yeah. That's the Lord showing you that you've got every book that's supposed to be in this book right here. Jesus confirmed it when he said, all the blood shed from Abel, righteous Abel, to Zechariah in the temple, confirming that last book in the New Testament, Malachi being Second Chronicles in a Jewish Bible. What about that? What about that? I see God when I read this book right here. Oh, yeah, but they, they hate it. There used to be an old boy named Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was a wicked, wicked infidel. He's very famous. You hear him talk about in school and stuff, but they don't tell you that poor old Thomas Paine he, he wrote that famous book back in the 1770s, The Age of Reason. And it made all these liberal free thinkers come up. Oh, yeah, you can explain everything by reason. There's no God. There's no Bible. And it's always this. When people start teaching there's no God, they always got a reason for it. And the reason is they want to live like the devil. And they're trying to get rid of him. Let's get rid of him. Uh, that's why people don't believe in God. People don't believe in God because of a scientific reason. People don't believe in God because of a sin problem. They don't want to hope they ain't one. They're hoping like crazy they ain't one. So Thomas Paine he finally wound up drunk 
lost everything he had and died. And when Thomas Paine died, before he died, they say that he rejected and, and regretted ever printing that book, The Age of Reason. And when Thomas Paine died, he died broke, drunk, six people came to his funeral. And they put on their poor Tom Paine, there he lies. Nobody laughs and nobody cries. Where he has gone or how he fares, nobody knows and nobody cares. That's the end of a man who spent his life trying to attack this book right here. I don't believe I'd want to be one of these people. that I wouldn't want to be Marilyn Manson for all the money in this world. Ripping out pages of it, storming it, spitting on it. No, sir, brother. I, that, I see God in that book right there. Listen, Ingersoll, the famous atheist Ingersoll, he held up the Bible and he said, in 15 years, I'll have that book in the morgue. It's going to be buried. 15 years went by, Ingersoll was in the morgue. And the Bible was doing just fine. Oh, Hume, I think David Hume, the famous atheist said, me thinks me see the end of twilight of Christianity. He said, Christianity's dying, just like John Lennon said. He said, Christianity's going, it's dying. Guess what? He died, and the Auxiliary Bible Society of Edinburgh had their first meeting in that room where that old boy died. Ain't the Lord got some kind of reaping what you saw? Voltaire, the famous atheist, held up a Bible. He said, in 100 years, the Bible will be outmoded and forgotten. 100 years went by, and Voltaire's house was owned and used by Geneva Bible Society to put out copies of the Word of God. Listen, buddy, you, you better stay out of the way of that thing right there. It'll smash you. You best just line. Listen, I know when I meet y'all, I can't go against that. I can't go against that. I'm just going to line up with it and do what it says. And you're a lot better off doing that. I see God in that book right there. Finally, and this time I mean it. I see God. One day, I will see him face to face. Amen. Turn to Revelation 22. Let me show you this. We can shout. Revelation 22. Brother Danny, are we going to really see God? Yep, we sure he is. Yes, sir. Revelation 22. Revelation chapter number 22. After it's all over, when we have our glorified body, the devil and his angels and Antichrist on the lake of fire, the judgments are done past, millennium's done over. Revelation 22. And verse number four, Bible said this, and they shall see his face. Woo! Glory to God, his name shall be in their forehead. And live. When he said, no man has seen God, something changed. You know what changed? We got saved. Then we got raptured, took home to be with Jesus. Then we come back and rule with Him in the millennium. And then they have the great wife. We'll have our glorified body. Our body will be fashioned like unto His glorious body. And then you know what He says? We shall see His face. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait just to see His face. But listen, when I see His face, that means we'll be done with sin. There'll never be no more sin. There'll never be no more sin. I tell you, sin is sneaky. Sin, it robs us of our peace, our joy, all the trouble we got in this world because of sin. I, I'm out of the big, uh, one day we'll have the victory over it. It'll be gone. We'll have rest. We'll have power. Never, ever, ever have to worry about sinning again. We'll see his face. Not only that, they'll be done, we'll be done with sorrow. All the heartbreak in this world. All the heartache. This whole world's full of it. You don't believe it? Go to the hospital. All the hospital. All the heartache of a mother over a child. All the heartache of a wife over a husband. I talked to a man yesterday whose who wife had left him years ago. I can tell he's still hurt. Still ain't over it. All the first, where little kids have to crawl under the bed when daddy comes home. Beating mom and cussing and screaming and hollering. All the kids that get their feelings hurt at school or being made fun of because of the way they look or because they don't have nice enough clothes and all the hurt and the sorrow, it'll all be over with then. When we see his face, brother, there'll be no more sorrow. And then there'll be no more sickness either. Amen. There'll be no suffering. Hallelujah. No harm. Listen, I've been in the hospitals with people. He's in there and they'll take their loved ones. One of, my, one of my good friends, J.D., y'all remember J.D., me and him, 
played a lot of ball together and, and stuff. And OJD is a good friend of mine. And he was a logger up there in Maine. He's cut the tree down one day. Then that chainsaw. And you know them, you can't never tell how them things are going to, a tree is going to be. And that, a limb about that big round right? And it crushed his skull. And they, they took him to the hospital and they and they told his wife that Sherry, they said, uh, they said uh, he can't live. They said he can't live. He's, he's mine, he's crushed his skull. Said we'll keep him eye on this machine. They called me. I, I was up in Maryland preaching at a church. Sherry goes, she's just a bawling. She said, Brother Danny, come home. Brother Danny, come home. And I said, Sherry. I will be there. I had a plane ticket or something. I was flying. I couldn't, I couldn't just leave up there and come home. And I said, I'll be home Friday. I promise you I'll come straight to the hospital. She come the next day. She's bawling. She said, Danny, she said, please, please. And she said, I'm not going to let them do it. You get here. I can't stand the thoughts of that. I said, now, Sherry, J.D. saved. He's ready to meet the Lord. And I know, but I just want you to be here. I want you to be here. And I said, I'll be there just as quick as I can. I got home. I drove to Asheville. Went in the hospital over there. There laid my friend. I, I mean, that J.D. been good to me. He helped me do landscaping around my house. Me and him, uh, we, we'd visit. And I, I mean, when he got saved, one of the greatest services I've ever seen was the night J.D. got saved. J.D. laying there in that hospital bed. And his daughter, Marlene, crying. And his wife, Sherry, crying. And she said, Brother Danny, I said, all right, I'm here. Went there and I grabbed his hand up. I prayed and I said, God, thank you for this good man that I've known these many years. And sure enough, they took the thing loose. And just in a few minutes, there was no heartbeat. He's gone. She bawled. Her daughter bawled. And I went out there and I went, went to the graveyard, buried that man, as I've done with hundreds more. I can't tell you the time. I remember one time we had a funeral in Marion and it was snowing. It was snow. Flakes that big. And I always, I looked up there, that's the saddest thing you ever seen in your life is a funeral in a snowstorm. And then people carrying out there, all the family crying, putting that body in that, in that, in that hearse. We got out there and we got to the graveyard and people was getting stuck. And they couldn't get up there and had to push. It was awful. It was awful. And I remember another one going over there and marrying one time, big old pile of red dirt. I just see this big pile of red dirt. And I thought, you know what? these days one of these days ladies and gentlemen all that's going to be gone no more trips to the hospital no more trips to the graveyard no more going to the divorce court none of this stuff going on we shall see his face Lord of God and all our troubles will be over Penny Crosby wrote face to face I shall behold him Far beyond the starry sky, face to face, in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Face to face I shall behold him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by. I'm going to see God. And you can too. The things of this world, don't, don't let them cheat you. Don't let them cheat you. Come this morning. Get your life right with God on this altar. And leave here this morning. Say, buddy, I'm going to a better place. And I'm going to see him one day. Stand with the head back on, girl. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. Now, Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, nobody's moving. In reverence, bow your head. Close your eyes. Be real still and quiet. Look, look, ma'am, sir, you're not here by accident this morning. God brought you here this morning to hear this. And I know the Lord put this message on my heart. Somebody here needs to get out of your seat. Quit fighting it. Quit fighting it. Like the guy with Bulldog like Billy Sunday quit fighting it just quit fighting it you know what I'm coming to the Lord this morning I'm coming to see Father I pray right now that you help that girl that mom that daddy whoever it is here this morning that needs to come to this altar 
God, I pray that you give them the grace to step out, make that step they need to make this morning before they leave this place. Lord, I'm so thankful that one day we shall see you face to face. Help us to live for you every day till that day comes. Lord, God, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord, to God. In Jesus' name. Let God speak to you this morning. We're going to go sing. If you, if you feel a little tug down in your heart, get out of your seat. Some's already coming. You come on right now. Come on. Hey man, come on, come on. That's right. Come on, young man. Come on, young lady. God speak your heart. Hey man. Hey man. Hey man. Hey man. Hey man. Hey Hey man. Hey man. Hey man. Hey man. Hey Set my spirit free. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. And one day I'll see yeah. him. Yeah, think about it. We're going to see his face. We'll see his face. For his marvelous yeah. grace. Yes, and I'll hear him say, child. Yeah, man. Oh, one day I'll see him. Live for that day, buddy. Live for that day. Hey, man, come on. Come on, girl. Come on, man. Get out of your seat. Come on. Come on. Come on, right now. Just get out of your seat. Walk down here and say, Lord, I'm going to see you one of these days. The Bible says you're going to see him one way or the other. You'll see him at the great white throne. You'll see him over there on the other side. Hey man, you come right now. Come on. Come on. Come on, right now. Come on. Come on. Get out of your seat, Get out of your seat. Come on, right now. Come on, right now. But I know that he lives. Never I'm going to see him. He lives within me. Hey man. Say, hey man. Hey man, y'all pray. And one day I'll see him. Look on his face. Yeah. 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 Come on. Amen. Come on. His marvelous Lord of God. And I'll hear him say, Yeah. Thank God. We're going to see him one day. Lord of God. One day. I'll see him. Say it. Say it, girl. Go ahead. said people during the tribulation and all that will cry for the rocks and the mountains they say hide us from the face of him they don't want to see him they don't want to see him they want to hide from him but they're going to every eye will see him one day you're either ready or you're not ready my goodness I would want to stand in front of him with eyes like flame of fire knows everything I've ever done I'm going to stand right in front of him. Uh-uh. I'm glad I got protection. I'm glad I got forgiveness. Amen. Get it while you can. Amen. All right. One day, we're going to see it. This ain't no fairy tale.
It's reality. That's why church, that's why church is so important, y'all. It's so important. The church is the most important thing on this planet. It's the only thing in this world Jesus died for. Amen. Don't underestimate the importance of church in your life and in your kids' lives. Be, be here. Be faithful. 2024. Start out afresh. Get it started. Get it right today. Especially if you've got kids. Get in here. All right. All hearts clear? Now, all right, we're going to meet back tonight. I think we got business from other churches coming. Uh, Brother Daniel's here up in Ashland, Kentucky. I think they got him back there driving crazy with them kids. They, he's preaching in junior church. That'll get him broke in just right. They won't start a bus ministry up there where he's at. And I said, all right, here's what. And he's going to ride Ethan's bus, I guess, one of y'all's bus home, Daniel. That'll get him broke in. Uh, so uh, uh, let's let's be back this evening at 6 o'clock. Adults especially. All the adults need this tonight. Support the kids. And we're going to have a youth meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. God will bless you for it. All hearts clear? All right, let's bow our head and dismiss the word of prayer. Amen. Vince, go ahead.